Okay, um, good morning everybody. Um, let me say first of all thank you very much um, to Brenda for inviting me um, to come and speak today. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Liam Young. I'm a solicitor um, at Renfrewshire Council. Um, I manage the litigation team there um, who has responsibility, uh, among many, many other things, for uh, giving advice in adult support protection cases and uh, making any court applications for protection orders. Um, and as we'll see, the topic today is undue pressure and that, of course, is relevant in, in circumstances where a protection order is being sought. Um, I, um, a, a bit about me and, and two not too subtle plugs. Um, I started at a North Lanarkshire Council, I trained there and was fortunate enough to finish just about uh, the time that the Act was coming into force and North Lanarkshire Council Adult uh, Protection Committee was funding a post for a solicitor, so the time really couldn't be better for me. And that gave me a chance really to get in there at the beginning um, with a lot of the considerations of, about adult support protection, in particular looking at the law really with a fresh pair of eyes, um, it, was, it was very fresh and very new at the time. Um, and that led to me um, being involved in pre preparing the second edition of uh, the book Adult Protection in Scotland with Nicola Smith, which is still available in all good bookshops. <laughs> However, I, 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 would, I would be dropped by my publisher I didn't mention that we're currently working on a third edition of it, which we're hoping will be out later this year. It's taking us a wee bit longer than we'd hope to get that finished. So, um, but yes, it should be out later this year. So um, yes, please watch this space. The second not too subtle plug, this uh, undue pressure uh, uh, talk is based on some uh, training uh, that I've been doing in, in relation to this. First, at, uh, as part of the master's programme at the University of Stirling, um, I, I, was, I had an input in that, uh, looking at undue pressure specifically. And uh, then also uh, more generally looking at protection orders and doing some training around about protection orders uh, for people that maybe don't use them very often, which I think is pretty much everybody. I mean, nobody uses them that frequently. Um, and I've uh, had the pleasure of doing that at various places around the country. So as we'll see, one of the things I'm going to talk about is um, giving people professional confidence to make calls on this. And um, training, uh, I mean, plugs aside, training is essential really to that. Um, so, um, yes, if anybody's interested in arranging training around about this or any other topic, then you can get in touch with me and I'll happily uh, get that in the diary. So, um, in terms of what I'm looking at today, um, we will be looking uh, ultimately, I suppose, at the, at the AB case. Um, there is a lot in that case, if it wasn't obvious, um, then uh, I can say that there is a lot in that case, a lot uh, to, to, to read, um, and I, I would really heartily recommend you do read the report if you haven't done so already, because it's very, very interesting. In many respects, actually, undue pressure is the smallest part of that in terms of uh, how that played into that case, but it's no less important, I, I don't think, for that. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about undue pressure talk about when it's relevant, in other words, when should we be thinking about undue pressure, when should we be talking about it, and then uh, what are we talking about when we talk about undue pressure, how is it defined? Um, I'll then go on to talk a bit about how we would prove it in court, which obviously is a quite important element of this. Um, I would talk briefly about when is it not relevant, because I think that's also an important thing to think about, and then I'm going to try some of these thoughts back to the AB case um, and, and look at how some points that I'm, I'm going to be making are, are, are illustrated in that case. Okay, so the, the, the first point is, I suppose, when we're talking about undue pressure, we're talking about protection orders. Um, and for anybody that's not sure about that, the protection orders that are contained in the 2007 Act are assessment orders, removal orders, banning orders. Um, temporary banning orders, as well, they count banning orders. So um, there's three types really of protection order, and that's them. Um, I suppose at the beginning it's maybe worth just pausing to note, as, as I've already kind of alluded to, the vast majority of adult protection work is done without resort to any of these orders. Um, they were never intended to be, you know, it's not like AWI where very often, you know, most of your cases are going to end with you going for a guardianship. This, this um, is, is, these are really last resort. And, and in particular, the assessment orders and removal orders are intended for very uh, narrow sets of circumstances that you 
almost never come across. So um, it's it's not a surprise that we've not got a whole wealth of ban of of uh, protection orders um, uh, being applied for out there. But uh, but they are useful. Um, or most of them are useful. And um, as I say, uh, it's in the context of applications for protection orders that we're talking about undue pressure. The relevant section of the Act is Section 35, and as, as much as I appreciate talking about the law, particularly just before lunch, is guaranteed to turn people off. But I, I think it's important for us to go through this section in, in a bit of detail, because each subsection has got something of interest in it for us. Um, firstly, the sheriff must not make a protection order if the sheriff knows that the affected adult at risk has refused to consent to the granting of the order. And two, a person must not take any action for the purposes of carrying out or enforcing a protection order if the person knows that the affected adult at risk has refused to consent to the action. If you think about it, this is quite an unusual situation then. Um, I can't really think of any other circumstance in which um, the, the question of whether a, a court order should be granted is down to, comes down to consent of the person that's, that's you know, the subject of the order. And even less is it the case, ordinarily, when you've got the order, the enforcement of the order even hinges on whether or not that person consents. But, but that's what we have here in relation to protection orders. So that's quite an important restriction on when an order can be granted or, or enforced. And I suppose I would just say at this point as well, quickly, what that really means is you've got to be thinking about consent at three points in the process. Before you make the order, you'll need to be satisfying yourself as to whether or not the adult's consenting. The sheriff then has to be convinced that the adult's consented. And then finally, when you've got your order, even when you've got it in your grubby hand and you're going to go and enforce it, you again have to be thinking, is the adult consenting to this? And of course, that position might change over the course of that time. So it's a major, it's a major limitation, um, sorry, it's a major limitation, but um, there is an exception to that. And uh, the exception is, despite those sections, uh, a refusal to consent may be ignored if the sheriff or person reasonably believes that the affected adult at risk has been unduly pressurised to refuse consent and that there are no steps which could reasonably be taken with the adult's consent which would protect the adult from the harm which the order or action is intended to prevent. That second bit I'm hoping should be obvious to people. It's a restatement basically of the least restrictive option principle which should be in your mind when you're doing this anyway. So you could argue that perhaps that's superfluous, but I suppose it's worth, worth having there to remind people. The main bit, and of course what we're here to talk about, is that the affected adult risk has been unduly pressurised to refuse consent. If you can show that, then the refusal to consent can be ignored by the sheriff or by somebody that's enforcing the order. So we have a kind of sort of definition of undue pressure uh, next it says, um, an adult at risk may be considered to have been unduly pressurised to refuse consent to granting of an order that's taking of an action if it appears that harm which the order or action is intended to prevent is being or is likely to be inflicted by a person whom the adult at risk has confidence and trust and that the adult at risk would consent if the adult did not have confidence and trust in that person. <clears throat> However, it then goes on to say, subsection 4 does not affect the generality of subsection 3. So in other words, Subsection 4 gives us an example of undue pressure, but it's not a complete definition of undue pressure. It doesn't, uh, it, it, you don't have to fall within the terms of this for, uh, for something to uh, constitute undue pressure. And if you look at the definition, I suppose that's obvious, really. What this is about is, is saying the harm or order is a, a, a sorry, the, the perpetrator, if you like, of the harm is somebody that the adult has confidence or trust in. They're applying the pressure and the adult would consent to the order if they didn't have confidence or trust in that harmer. So that's a kind of very specific set of circumstances. You could, in, in kind of legal speak, I suppose, this is what we might call a contractual situation, undue influence situation, where you trust somebody who's trying to do you over, basically. Uh, whether uh, in contract situations, it's often because they're an expert or something like that. You trust them, and, and they take advantage of that trust. This is kind of close to that, so it's a kind of undue influence, we might call it, but it's not the complete definition of undue pressure. So we'll come back to exceptions uh, later on, as I mentioned, but it's, it's worth just pointing out that there's a specific exception here. Uh, neither subsection 3 nor any other provision 
authorises a council officer or health professional or other council nominee to ignore a refusal by a person to consent to participate in an interview or a medical examination. So that's an important exception. Whether or not you think the person is being unduly pressurised to refuse to consent to an interview, to refuse to consent to a medical examination, you cannot override that refusal. Okay, and then there's a little bit of definition there which we don't need to detain ourselves with. Okay, so um, let's think about this then in terms of definition of undue pressure. As I've said, we've got statutory definition there, but it's clear that it's just one example of undue pressure. So the usual rule for statutory interpretation is that unless there's a specific definition given, the words should otherwise be given their ordinary and natural meaning in the context of the provision in the statute as a whole. In other words, what do these words mean in ordinary language? In looking at anything in relation to this Act, or indeed any other Act, um, local authorities and health professionals do have to take into account Scottish Government guidance. Um, and we'll come on to look at the Scottish Government guidance on this in just a second. However, I pause to say that's not the case for the courts. Um, sheriffs don't have to listen to Scottish Government guidance at all. Um, they, they often don't, in fact, um, and so that's that. For as far as sheriffs are concerned, they'll just be looking at the words of the Act and, and teasing out what they think it means. But that's not to say Scottish Government guidance isn't persuasive, and certainly you would want to be presenting that if there's a debate to be had around what the meaning of undue pressure is before the sheriff. So the Code of Practice, this is from the most recent version of the Code of Practice. It's very similar, I think possibly even identical to the original Code of Practice um, that was published just after the Act came into force. Um, but uh, it goes to say, um, undue pressure can also be applied by an individual who may or may not be the person suspected of harming the adult, such as a neighbour, carer or other person. For example, a relative who is not suspected of causing the harm, but does not, for whatever reason, wish the council to apply for an order, may place undue pressure on the affected adult to refuse consent. Undue pressure may also be applied by a person that the adult is afraid of, or who is threatening them, and whom the adult does not trust. So, um, what that's basically saying is that that specific definition, what I called undue influence earlier on, isn't the whole definition. We've got these other situations that, will, that, that uh, could constitute undue pressure. It might not be the person that's causing the harm that's applying the pressure. Um, it, it might not be somebody that the adult has confidence or trust in. Um, it might be somebody that's threatening them. Um, and I think if somebody's threatening them, I think that would be a pretty cast iron uh, a situation of undue pressure. I think you'd find it pretty easy to demonstrate that. So, as I said, the ordinary meanings of the words is, is basically what we fall back on. And the ordinary meanings, as far as the, the, the Oxford English Dictionary is concerned, pressure, um, there's lots of different definitions of pressure, so we're not getting into scientific stuff about pounds per square inch or anything like that. Uh, pressure, a, a relevant definition is the use of persuasion or intimidation to make someone do something. So, um, I think, I mean, if you look at that, persuasion, intimidation, Okay, to make someone do something. Um, intimidation, I think, if someone's being intimidated, I think we can think of that as undue pressure. That kind of sounds like persuasion, not always, sometimes. And when does persuasion shade over into intimidation? Well, um, we might all give a different answer to that, I suppose, and it's certainly going to be very dependent on the circumstances. So that definition only takes us really so far. Undue not appropriate or suitable, improper, not in accordance with what is just and right, unjustifiable, illegal, right. So again, I, I pause just to, to note, illegal, probably you could say there's a kind of objective definition of that, but uh, these other terms, unjustifiable, what, not in accordance with what's just and right, not appropriate or suitable, improper, these are all value judgments, a bit like the, the distinction between what's persuasion and what's intimidation. There, there are value judgments in there. And so my conclusion really on all of this, in terms of a definition of undue pressure, is uh, what's known in law as the elephant test. And it sounds ridiculous, but I promise you there's very austere, very um, good authority that makes reference to this elephant test. The case that I've cited there is Cadogan and Morris, which is a House of Lords case, so the highest court in the land 
it was on a quite different topic, but in that, uh, Stuart Smith said, this seems to me to be an application of the well-known elephant test. It is difficult to describe, but you know it when you see it. So an undue pressure. Difficult to describe, but you know it when you see it. And in case anybody thinks that I'm being really ridiculous applying this to uh, adult protection cases, it's also been referred to at the Court of Protection down in England in relation to deprivation of liberty. So, um, as I say, it maybe sounds a bit uh, silly, but um, it's referred to in cases involving very serious situations. Um, so, you know when you see it, what, what does that mean? It could be a bit scary, really. You're not being given a definition. Well, what I'm saying is, Professionals are empowered to make judgments as to what is pressure and what is undue pressure in the circumstances that they are faced with. These, these people, you people, are people who are dealing with these situations all the time. You are out there in the community. You may already know the adult. If you don't, you'll probably have access to people who know the adult very well. You'll know their circumstances. You'll have found out about their history. You'll be looking at their relationships in, in, and, and closely scrutinising those. You are the people who are empowered to make a decision as to whether or not you consider that that adult is refusing to consent because they're being unduly pressurised. So it's on you that you should feel empowered by that, not scared. <laughs> but it's also a responsibility, and, it, and, and it's a professional responsibility to interrogate that judgement. So if you get that gut feeling and you're thinking to yourself, this person's not consented to this because they're being pressurised. It's undue pressure, definitely. Interrogate that. Ask yourself, well, why? Why do I think that? What is it about this situation that I consider to be pressure, to consider, that I consider to be undue pressure? And the second bit of that responsibility is to record that reason. Now, I say that for two real reasons. I mean, recording, you'll probably be sick of people telling you to record, 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 record. But uh, particularly lawyers telling you to record, record, record. But, um, but there's two real reasons for that. Firstly, it helps you with the first bit. Um, reducing down what is perhaps a gut feeling or a hunch to some words in a case note or even just on a bit of paper, um, that helps you to interrogate that judgment. It helps you to think carefully. What are the features of this situation that I consider to constitute undue pressure? If you're forced to write it down, it'll make you think far more clearly about it. I can guarantee that. And it may also, when you write it down, expose some gaps in your logic. And maybe you'll have to think about that and, and address that. But the second point is the straightforward one, that if you've recorded your reasons for it, then when you come back to the case later, or somebody else comes back to the case later, they'll understand what you were saying about that. And there are good reasons in terms of court process that I'll come on to, to, to make sure you've got a properly recorded uh, position um, in your case notes um, about these kind of important points. So, you should feel empowered to make the decisions, but you recognise also that you've got a responsibility if you're making those decisions to interrogate it properly and to record it properly. <coughs> okay, so we've talked about when undue pressure comes up. We've talked a bit about what it is. Um, how do we evidence it? When you get to court, if you're making that application for a protection order, how do we go about uh, evidencing it? Um, first thing is, what are we trying to evidence? And, I, and I've, I've put this up here. I mean, this is kind of this goes back to the process of interrogation earlier on. This is the kind of stuff you should be asking yourself when you're writing that case note, when you're recording that you think the adult's under undue pressure. Who is pressuring the adult? Who is it? What's the relationship? That's always going to be important if you're evidencing pressure, undue pressure. What are they doing? Seems obvious, but well, what are they doing? What is it that they're, up, that they're up to? Why are they doing it? What's their motive in doing this? I don't think necessarily motive is always going to make a, a huge difference as to whether something is persuasion or intimidation or, or, or however uh, you want to put it undue or not, undue pressure. But motive is bound to be important. And so uh, why do you think they're doing, they're doing it? Why do they say they're doing it? When did they do it? Potentially could be important. Was it six months ago? In which case we might have a harder time showing that this pressure is really having an effect. Or was it just last week? Or was it when you were there talking to the adult and asking for their opinion? What is the effect on the adult? This is maybe the most important one, really. Um, what, what's, uh, 
what's the impact? Is the adult the same? Are, are they visibly uh, intimidated? Are they anxious? Are they nervous about talking to you about these things? Or are they feeling happy? Do they seem at ease? Um, these are all uh, relevant questions as to whether or not this is pressure, whether or not it's undue pressure. And last of all, although maybe this should be first of all, does it fit within the specific example in section 35? We've got a specific definition, as I say, it's not a complete definition, but if you can get it through that gate, then nobody can argue with you. It definitely is under pressure. In terms of the actual process of evidence at, at, um, at court, um, I'll, I'll not go into detail, but this is a whole Evidence is a whole subject that you have to do if you're if you're doing a law degree. It's it's fascinating stuff. But the um, the kind of I suppose the kind of high level of this for people that maybe aren't intimately involved in court work uh, daily, the burden of proof to, to show that undue pressure is there will be on the local authority. So in other words, people who are applying for the order. <clears throat> what that means is is that it's up to the local authority to come up with the evidence. Um, if there's no evidence then the sheriff will not be able to find that there's been undue pressure. Um, the standard of proof, though, is only the balance of probabilities. So if you're familiar with courtroom dramas, they're always about criminal law. Nobody ever made a courtroom drama about civil law, I don't think, because it's pretty boring. So uh, the standard of proof uh, in, in, in criminal cases, as you all know, is uh, beyond reasonable doubt. It's only balance of probabilities in a civil case. So what that means is any fact that you're relying on you just have to satisfy the sheriff that it more, it's more likely to have happened than not. It's a 50-50 kind of thing. You say evidence is admissible in a cases, in, in civil cases. Um, Hearsay evidence is when somebody is giving evidence to something that somebody else said or saw. So instead of getting it from the person themselves, you get it from somebody that they said it to. Uh, now, there are all kinds of problems with that in criminal law. You're not allowed to use hearsay evidence and, and so on and so forth. You can use it in civil law. However, there's a bit of a kind of uh, warning sign there because you're still supposed to present the best evidence. So the way that this most often comes up in these kind of undue pressure cases and things like that is you'll have somebody saying, well, the adult said this to me or, you know, that person, you know, the person applying the pressure said this to me about such and such and so and so. And the question the sheriff might ask is, well, why don't we have the adult here to say that themselves? Why don't we have that person here to say that themselves? But there might be good reasons you can't get those people there. Um, so in those circumstances, hearsay evidence is admissible and it might be the best evidence you can get in those circumstances. You can use it. Right, now we come on to the recording bit again. Records of an undertaking may speak for themselves in civil cases. What that means? Uh, if we produce your case notes and it's all nicely set out in there, what happened, how you dealt with it, the decision making process and all the rest of it, these then can be docketed, they can be produced at court and you don't then have to speak to those records, you don't actually have to come and give all that evidence that's already in the, in the case notes already. So it can cut down significantly on the amount of time you have to spend giving evidence in cases like these if you've got good case notes because they can just be produced. If the case notes are dogs dinner, you're usually better not producing them, so it's uh, <laughs> at that point that we feel you in to, to, to talk to it directly. Okay, so again, a, a, another injunction, please, do case notes. Okay. Right, another interesting question that comes up in, in this in terms of evidencing under pressure. How do you prove someone's intention? I was talking about intention earlier on, saying it's potentially quite important. It is potentially quite important. How do we do that in a, a, a civil case, in any kind of court case really? Why they're doing what they're doing? Well the answer is that the court will assess that based on an objection, an objective sorry, consideration of their actions. So you don't have to actually prove what the person is thinking. You don't have to get some kind of brain scan or they don't have to have confessed to what their, what their motive was. The court will look at the way that they're behaving and apply just their kind of common sense in terms of how people normally behave to come up with a decision on whether, you know, how, uh, what the intention was behind those actions. So, um, you know, uh, well, well, we'll come on to an example, I think, from the, from the, from the AB case that maybe helped kind of elucidate that, but um, it's, it's an objective test, it's not a subjective test that the court applies. So they, they ask the question, what can we reasonably infer are the intentions of someone who's acting in that manner? 
Okay, so that's how we might go about evidence in it, and a, a few kind of points about court procedure. Um, just the kind of, now the kind of proviso. What the limitations of undue pressure? Um, first point, I've made it already, but let's uh, hammer it home. Undue pressure is only referred to in the context of protection orders under adult support protection. It doesn't apply to other actions in terms of that legislation, and it doesn't apply to other legislation. So the, the, the term doesn't appear in the AWI Act, for example, or uh, the mental health legislation. Um, and we've already said this, but let's again hammer this home. In particular, refusal to participate in an interview or medical assessment cannot be overcome by reference to undue pressure. That's the case whether you've got an assessment order or not. It's one of the reasons that I think assessment orders are pretty useless. But we'll not go into that just now because I'll waste, uh, waste the whole morning. Um, but um, yes, you cannot overcome that refusal by reference to undue pressure. You'll have to, if you want to force somebody to undergo an assessment, you have to look at other legislation, mental health legislation. I suppose there's a question about what it means to force someone to undertake an interview anyway. I mean, you're not going to get the torture instruments out, are you? So, you know, what does it actually mean if they're not going to, if they're not going to go along with you, if they're not going to go along with you? Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, protection orders themselves, as I mentioned, are limited in their application, so that means that this is really quite a, a narrow point that we're talking about here. And um, the question of consent and order becomes particularly muddy when it's applied to a situation where a person lacks capacity. Um, the, what I'm saying here is there's usually clearer cut and more effective alternatives in those cases and um, anybody that's been to the training that we do on this um, we do look a bit at what those alternatives are we don't have time to look at them today but I think uh, really just to kind of elaborate a little on this point this is an important one the question of capacity I mean it's, it's well established I hope everybody here is totally clear in their minds that a uh, Capacity is not directly relevant to the question of whether somebody's an adult at risk. They can be an adult at risk with capacity, they can be an adult at risk without capacity. So that's clear enough. Um, unfortunately, though, the bit uh, of this where if you, if you cast your minds back to the statutory uh, uh, point about consent to uh, protection orders, what it says is that the sheriff can't grant the order uh, if he or she is aware of the fact that the adult is refusing to consent. It doesn't say they have to be aware that the adult is consenting, they say that they can't grant it if they're aware they are not consenting. Now, that's a bit backwards, and I'm told, or I was told many moons ago by somebody that was involved in drafting the bill, um, that the thinking behind that was that if you've not got capacity to consent to an order, then you don't have capacity to refuse consent to the order. So if you don't have capacity to refuse consent to the order, the whole question of consent disappears if a person doesn't have capacity. Now, I have to admit that that was pretty dubious at the time. What was that, 15 years ago? Longer ago than that. But if it was dubious then, it's completely nonsense now. Nobody believes that because you don't have capacity to consent to an order, you just have to be assumed that you're consenting. That's it, you know. Um, so, uh, if, if that was ever, as I say, the, the position, it's not any longer. So, in other words, <laughs> It doesn't operate the way it's supposed to operate, and there is, as a result, there's nothing really in there about what it means to consent to an order in circumstances where people don't have capacity. So that's why I say you're usually better avoiding it. Because it's a tricky legal question that there's not really an answer to. And there are, there's no, um, I haven't checked this morning, but as of yesterday, there's no, uh, there are no reported cases to help untie that knot. But the good news is there are alternatives, and in 99 times out of 100, when you're dealing with a person that doesn't have capacity, that lack of capacity will be due to a mental disorder. So you'll be looking potentially at other legislation, AWI, mental health legislation, to achieve the same outcomes, and sometimes even uh, better outcomes than you'll get under the protection orders. Okay, so I'm gonna finish just by um, tying back to the EB report. Um, as, as I say, it's a very interesting deed, and I'm really only selecting some tiny bits out of the report to illustrate some of the points that I've made. So please, if you've not, go and read it all, um, and you'll see there's a lot more to it than just these points about undue pressure. Um, firstly, um, this, uh, I've just put some quotes and then I'll, I'll tell them back. This was not a straightforward case of alleged harmer and victim. However, there was evidence that CD was not always competent at caring for AB, which resulted in significant cumulative risks to AB's health. And there was evidence from AB's earlier detention in 2016 they were more engaging with medical treatment when CD's visits were restricted 
and AB had limited mobile phone contact. I've taken these two things out um, to talk about the, the issue of evidencing and <coughs> pressure. Um, there was a lot more, obviously, in the presentation just before, but, uh, uh, so you can go back and look at those uh, again if you, if you want to look at more of them. The first point, I think, kind of illustrates there would have been a difficulty here if there was an application for protection order. There would have been a difficulty in the sense that this doesn't look like it's a clear-cut case that goes under the definition that's in the Act. It's not clear that this that CD is the alleged harmer here in, in all circumstances. So it doesn't necessarily fit under that, but as I pointed out, that's not fatal to it being a situation of undue pressure. In fact, that's a very specific example of undue pressure. Undue pressure is a much wider concept. Um, and that's evidence, I think, by the next point. There was evidence from EP's earlier detention that they were more engaging with medical treatment when the, the visits were restricted than when they weren't. Well, there's something you could bring out in your evidence to the court to begin to show undue pressure. And what you're focusing on is the impact on the adult. What, what's changed for the adult when CDs are around? Um, and uh, does that demonstrate undue pressure? Um, other points about evidence and, and maybe limitations. Uh, the Commission's view <coughs> excuse me, is that the local authority applying the ASP framework and attempting to assess and support protect AB, however, AB's poor engagement with staff and a lack of clarity in relation to capacity made this approach difficult. Whilst accepting ASP legal interventions may not have fully addressed concerns in this situation. Despite regular ASP meetings, we saw little recorded discussion of the concept of undue influence or pressure, a lack of use of chronologies and inconsistent protection plans and decision making. We are pleased the local authority concerned have updated their interagency ASP procedures and practice since this time, and this includes guidance on non-engagement. So, starting from the bottom, working our way up. A recording, again, a point about recording. So uh, this illustrates, I think, the importance of that. Um, it's, it's not just about thinking about things, it's about recording that you're thinking about things. It's ultimately going to be important. And as, as I've said, I think it helps structure your thinking apart from anything else. But also, important limitations. Um, capacity was a, an issue, you might say the main issue, certainly laterally in this case. So um, perhaps, not a situation where we would be looking at protection orders and therefore, of course, undue pressure, not something that's applicable in those circumstances. It's only when you're looking at protection orders and, uh, a, a, you know, a, 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 in terms of the ASP. And in terms of definitions, I don't know if you'll be able to read that from a distance, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. The concept of undue pressure introduced in the 2007 Act can present dilemmas for professionals during the course of adult support protection investigations. Such a dilemma occurred in this case. The Scottish Government's Code of Practice details undue pressure, but public bodies may want to focus on undue pressure as part of the ASP learning and development programmes, particularly on what evidence of undue pressure can be presented to a court when seeking a protection order. Similar considerations apply to coercive control or undue pressure. In such situations, the control exercised over a vulnerable person may render them unable to take, action, to take or action decisions that would protect them from harm. It is therefore important to understand the person's decision-making processes. This should include an understanding of any factors which may have impinged on or detracted from their ability to make and action free and informed decisions to safeguard themselves. In these circumstances, an affected person should be regarded as unable to safeguard themselves. I'm going to commend that second paragraph to you as a very helpful tool for you thinking about undue pressure. The factors that are outlined there, the control exercised over a vulnerable person may render them unable to take or action decisions that would be taken from harm. Let's think about that. It's important to understand the person's decision-making processes. Let's think about that. Let's get that, uh, let's put that into a process we're thinking about whether we were presented with an undue pressure situation. And going up a bit earlier on, the dilemma that you face with as a professional. But I come back to this point. You are a professional, you know better than probably anybody else whether or not this is a situation of undue pressure. So have the confidence to make that decision and the responsibility to make sure you do it properly and you record it properly. So, summing up, um, undue pressure, it applies to questions of whether to grant and or enforce protection orders, but only protection orders. Professionals should feel empowered to know it when they see it, 
And a self-critical approach, approach to that judgment will help provide a framework for you to evidence that when it comes to court. I hope that this is of some help in giving you that feeling of empowerment to make these decisions. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.